come and receive services. Like we have majority of the, the, the uh, refugees now are Muslims. And a lot of them do not walk into a church just like that. You need a safe place outside of the church. And it has been very difficult, you know, just providing place and, and providing the things that people need in terms of food, clothing, and shelter. What we try to do is and we try to integrate the uh, immigrant community into the main um, stream society. And we do it by uh, teaching them citizenship classes. We have an uh, immigration legal department that helps them to walk through the, uh, the immigration system. And we uh, advocate for immigration reform. So we uh, not only work with our community, but we also work with the legislators. And we uh, have these discussions where we present them the human face of the immigration issue. And so one of the compelling um, needs of growing numbers of our kids is to, um, to find a place that feels safe, um, in many cases in a physical sense, but also in an emotional and a spiritual sense. Uh, and so a, a, a part of my mission is to, um, to challenge the church to provide community for so many children and families who don't know that. I can now see yeah. there's a young man from Sierra Leone, Mustafa Ba Attila, that we assisted. He was able to come here he, in Sierra Leone during the war when they were killing all these people. A blind person, they were after him because he was a radio journalist, and he couldn't run away. But God miraculously got him out of that. But when he got here, immigration problem was a big obstacle. We were able to assist this guy, not only to get political asylum, but to get adaptive computer software. Today, he's one of the leading musicians in Virginia. And God willing, he's coming to Boston in, in the month of May to perform for a program that we're having. That's the blind being able to see. We we all know that if you if you just come alongside and do um, and be the instruments of Christ's grace in their lives that you, we do have the capacity to, to um, turn these lives around and um, to give them a vision of what's possible. Little by little, you know, it's one person at a time. It's one application at a time. It's one phone call at a time. So for, for us, that's what really gives us the energy. And um, also, the fact that we are talking about these issues now in the church, in the body of Christ, that makes me feel like we're walking towards the right way. I mean, uh, here, most of them, majority of them, became Christian in other countries before coming to this country. And that was the work of missionaries that came from this country many years ago and saw the sea of the gospel around the world. But now, with refugees and immigrants coming here, I see that those same churches have shut the door. They want to have nothing to do with these people that Jesus loved so much that he died for. He came all the way from heaven and died for. Um, they want to have nothing to do with the, uh, with the refugees and the immigrants that are coming, whether they are Christians or not. And I, I really do, um, like you want to underscore the need for um, safety and security within the church. Uh, again, because so many individuals um, find their way to the church uh, from points of vulnerability, and to uh, to know that this is a place that will receive me just as I am, yes. that will wrestle with the things that um, I wrestle with, that will not simply um, spout spiritual platitudes. Uh, but will uh, really uh, meet me as I try to figure this out. And that something that I have realized is that when a pastor and, it, and his church or her church decide to do church and become the church outside of those walls, you can definitely see that the hand of God moving on favor and protecting them and providing the, the skills and, and for them to be creative and protecting themselves, protecting their church, at the same time that they are being the voice that is bringing healing and, and, and is responding to the need of those who are being oppressed or those who are in need. Only when our security comes from God alone will we remove the walls we build for our churches, our ministries, and ourselves. A city without walls means a new kind of security. One of my favorite lines from the Ethnic America Network video is of a pastor who speaks about what he expects to encounter as he attends a summit. 
He says, God is going to have me on a journey in the next few days, and then I'm going to have to figure out how to share that journey with my church when I return. Well, I've been on a journey for the past five years, for the first time as a summit attendee in Atlanta, and then I went to St. Louis, and then I went to Seattle, and then I went to uh, Phoenix, and now I'm here. And I've also been on a journey for the last two and a half years with the regional uh, listening team in planning for this summit. But the most important part of that journey is the people that you meet along the way. And our plenary speaker tonight, Jeanette Yep, has become one of those very important people that God has placed in my life as a colleague and as a friend. Jeanette Yep has been serving on the staff of Grace Chapel in Lexington, Mass. since 2007 as the pastor of Global and Regional Outreach. And she's brought a wealth of knowledge about intercultural ministry that has enriched not only my life, but also the life of the rest of our staff and our church. She's actually a native of Boston. She grew up attending the Boston Chinese Evangelical Church, which her parents helped start in 1961. Jeanette graduated from Mount Holyoke College and Northwestern University and has studied at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and Reg Regent College. For 30 years, she worked with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. She spent the first five of those years working with students on Boston area campuses, and then she moved to Chicago and held various positions of campus and national leadership, including vice president and director of multi-ethnic ministries. She teamed with other InterVarsity staff members to create a training program that helped Asian American students to integrate their ethnic identity with their faith. And she's contributed significantly to InterVarsity's commitment to multi-ethnicity in both makeup and outreach. And I know InterVarsity for me has been a role model in terms of understanding what multi-ethnic ministry looks like in the context that we um, experience at Grace Chapel. Auntie Jeanette, is recognized by many for her creative role as MC of the Urbana Missions Conventions in 1990, 1993, and 1996. She's helped plan a church in Chicago targeting previously churched and unchurched Asian Americans, and she is one of the authors of Following Jesus Without Dishonoring Your Parents. Before coming to Grace Chapel, she traveled globally for two years for the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, and there she developed and trained younger leaders, which is one of her great passions. So let's welcome Jeanette Yap. Don't usually do the mic thing, but I will. And I, um, we've had people come before us who have laid claim to this land, uh, Chief Caring Hands, and Pastor and Bishop. I want to lay claim to this avenue too. I was born and raised just down the street in Grove Hall on Castlegate Road. Our family home is still there, the triple decker that our family owned. The whole little street was united by one thing, we were all poor. And because we were poor, we were people of all kinds of races and colors. There were Jewish folk, our upstairs neighbor was Portuguese, there were some Chinese people, there were African American people, there were folk from the Caribbean. And we were there because that was our foothold into American life and culture. My grandpa came to this city in 1901, and the last century. He was one of the first Chinese immigrants uh, to Boston. So I just want to put my little stake in the ground, say I'm a bona fide Bostonian. <laughs> I'm glad to be home. Well, I can remember as if it happened yesterday. Nigeria is situated on the west coast of Africa, right on the equator, and it was summertime. I was accompanying one of my spiritual heroes, Ada Lum, a gifted Bible teacher who's traveled the world teaching people how to study the scriptures for themselves. And together, we were a part of a national Bible study conference for university students for a group called the Nigerian International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, or NIFES. Shortly after arriving in Nigeria, I was called a white lady. That was my first time I was called a white lady. <laughs> but when you do the skin tests, you realize, yeah, I am kind of white. 
Well, to make sure we were comfortable, our hosts insisted on us staying with a faculty member off-site. They wanted to spare us the opportunity to sleep on a concrete floor on a bamboo mat in a large, screenless meeting room. The husband of the home was away on a research trip in Europe, and his wife, a medical doctor, was home with her two sons, a 10-year-old guy and a 15-year-old. And together, they offered us generous and gracious Nigerian hospitality. Some of you know what I mean. This, their home was surrounded by a 10-foot high concrete wall. The top of that wall had broken glass, and this home was on the grounds of the university. Their watchman doubled as a gardener by day, and by night, he was the night watchman. He lived in a small house just inside the gate. He wore very thin flip-flops, and he was armed at night with a flashlight and a stick. One night, after the conference was over, we came back to our room, and I sat up straight and I said, Ada, did you hear that? There were footsteps and shouting in the bushes just outside our first floor window. We didn't need Wycliffe. Folks were angry and they were agitated. And quickly, our hostess called us into the central part of the hallway, away from the windows. The 15-year-old son bravely went out to join the night watchman to chase the burglars. As he left, he told us to shout loudly, to sound like we were many more. So we screamed. First we screamed, hi! And then we realized that was too high, so we started to low because we figured that was more threatening. We tried to sound like a gaggle of people who shouldn't be messed with. Ugh. So at one point while I was screaming, I said to, the house, to our, our hostess, shouldn't we call the police? Well, she gave me that patient look, like, you're not from here, are you? <laughs> and she said, well, if we can get a dial tone, we might be able to make a call out. But even if we make that call out, there's no way to know who will answer on the other side. The policemen may be for us or against us. And besides, they may not bother to come. She looked at me wisely and she said, we're better off praying. So by then, I was trembling. I was trembling in fear. And the little boy beside me started to cry. And this kind woman scooped both of us up in her arms. And she took us into the bedroom and she prayed. She prayed song, strong, insistent prayers, asking God to keep us safe from harm. Ada was left alone in the hallway, shouting alone, trying to sound like a legion of burly men. <laughs> but after what felt like a long, long time, the oldest son came back into the house with the night watchman. They managed to scare away the burglars, armed only with that night stick and two flashlights, and some anemic screaming from inside the house. We thanked God together for our safety. Then our hostess looked at us and suggested that we all go back to sleep. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, who or what do you trust in? Where do you place your security? For me, this incident made it abundantly clear. I'm embarrassed to say, but I need to be honest, I place my security and supreme trust at a time of great fear, not in God, but in government infrastructure. Why? Because as my experience as an Asian American person, a middle class person, a graduate, a college graduate, when I dial 911, the folks at the other end of the line are almost always responsive and alert. A little scary, but always responsive and alert. And for me, they have served and protected my family, my property, and myself. In Ibadan, Nigeria, my theology met my practice. When the burglar was dashing outside my bedroom window, I freaked. Instinctively, I wanted to call the police to help us. God being my security, not really. So here we are several hundred Jesus followers from all across North America, meeting in a church in inner city Boston. We've not been together long enough to really size each other up, but if we're honest, we're gathering lots of first impressions. Impressions that reflect our background and our experiences, or maybe impressions that simply reflect your last meal. <laughs> our minds, though, are gathering data the entire time. We're desperately trying to make meaning out of this gathering of new people, this new environment, receiving a new diet of information and content during the summer, during the summit. Some of us love this. 
others of us are beginning to feel a bit insecure, wondering if we belong, wondering, wondering if coming is worth the time and investment that is taken. Security, one word, many meanings. It can mean protection of a person, a building, an organization, or a country against threats such as crime or attacks by foreign countries. It's the idea of being free from risk and danger, experiencing protection and confidence. In the financial world, people will offer goods or property as security to a lender as a promise, just in case you can't pay them what you owe. Security can simply mean a group of people responsible to protect a, a building. And the online authority on all things, Wikipedia, suggests that security is related to safety, continuity, and reliability. The article in the wiki goes on to talk about perceived versus real security. And I didn't know the article writer had theological bent. Perceived or real security. Well, tonight, let's look at what real security is and to see if you and I are trusting in the right things or not. In an environment like this, if we're really honest, it's easier to stay in our protective cocoons of existing friends, familiar denominational or church structures, or even our own people or ethnic group. Oh, you know, we can be nice, we can smile, we can nod with the best of them like you're supposed to do at any Christian conference. Hi, how are ya? What's your name and where you're from? Welcome to Boston. <laughs> Have you had our chowder yet? <laughs> but will we feel secure enough to take a risk at this conference to go a little deeper with someone, to explore a little further an idea, even if you disagree with that idea? Are you going to feel secure to engage someone who's really different from me or from you? Well, as the Lord answers the prayers of his people, we're sure hoping that that's going to happen. By God's grace, we're going to experience together a new kind of security found in the Lord himself so that we can make our churches and our ministries a safe place for others, outsiders who have yet to darken our doors. To do this, we'll look at trust and security through the lens of a familiar psalm, Psalm 121. And at the end of my session, I'm going to share a practical tool I've used in a lot of cross-cultural training opportunities that you just might want to try on for size during this weekend. Who or what do you and I put our trust in? Where does our security come from? What is it going to take for our churches to be havens, sanctuaries of safety for the communities that we minister to? Let's stand up and read together Psalm 121. Join me, please, in the New International Reader's Version. I look up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. He is the maker of heaven and earth. He won't let your foot slip. He who watches over you won't get tired. In fact, he who watches over Israel won't get tired or go to sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is like a shade tree at your right hand. The sun won't harm you during the day. The moon won't harm you during the night. The Lord will keep you from every kind of harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your life no matter where you go, both now and forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Many of you I know know the context of this passage. It occurs in the section of the book of Psalms called the Psalms or Songs of Ascent, Psalms 120 to 134. And Hebrew pilgrims likely sang these 15 psalms, perhaps in sequence, as they went up to the temple in Jerusalem to celebrate great worship festivals. If families in those days traveled in minivans or SUVs, as we do today, this is probably the CD they pop into the player that the family would sing together as they were making that journey. These Psalms of Ascent were songs for the road, and they help us as people who travel in the way of faith in Christ. It helped folks then, and they can help us today remember who we are 
and where we're going. These psalms express amazement at God's grace, and yet they also quiet our anxieties and our fears. These psalms were meant to be sung in the in-between times, or to use this big GRE word, liminal, the liminal times, the times of transition. And perhaps for you, you're feeling like you're living in one of those times right now. Perhaps some of you are waiting for things to change. In your work, you've hit a significant snag. The problem is really vexing. The personnel issue just won't go away. Perhaps for others of you, you'd simply like work. It's been a long, long time of waiting already. You're in between. Maybe there's a child or a family member who is far from God, and your heart is breaking over their choices, the choices you see them make day in and day out. Maybe some of you feel in between because you've hit a rough patch in your marriage. Is it ever going to get better? Maybe some of you are facing significant health challenges, maybe issues of your own or your parents' aging. Are you waiting for God to break through in your church community in new ways? Are you seeing significant opportunities for ministry, but others seem to simply delight in punching holes into that vision that you sense God has given you? Have you been involved in some intense interpersonal battles between you and other members of the body? If you're alive and breathing and in a church, I can't believe how any of us could be immune from that. <laughs> but has that conflict taken the joy out of you? And are you waiting to see what's next? Well, these Psalms of Ascent are meant to be sung, especially in these times of transition. These Psalms are really brief hymns which provide courage, support, and inner direction. They're a guidebook, they're a travel song, they're a map for those of us who are on our journey to know God. And Psalm 121 offers real direction to us. It suggests, however subtly, that we may be placing our trust in things that don't last or in people or things that will ultimately disappoint us. This psalm describes a pilgrim who's going along in life's journey. And as there are many internet sites available today for a traveler to see if there's gonna be potential problems in weather or at an airport, so the psalmist offers Christians a traveler's advisory in Psalm 121. He suggests that there are three possibilities for harm for travelers in this evening's text. The first is that we could sprain our ankle when our foot slips in verse three. The second is that we could faint from sunstroke. So he offers us a shade tree as we see in verses five and six. And he talks also though about succumbing, the possibility of succumbing to emotional illness when the moon might harm us in the second part of verse six. You see, there were pressures and anxieties by traveling on foot for a long distance in those days. Ancient writers often call that, that feeling of weakness moonstroke. And we sometimes use a non-clinical term to describe this state, and we call it lunacy. So verses three through six point out potential pitfalls, two physical ones and one emotional one. And at some point in their distress, or in their worry, the pilgrim finally looks up and lifts his eyes to the hills for help. And what do you see? Where does my help come from? So picture yourself, if you will, surrounded by some hills and mountains. Go ahead, go there in your heads. I know we're here at Blue Hill Ave, but come on, let's go in your heads. Picture yourself surrounded by some hills and some mountains. And look up. When you are a person of faith and you look up in those hills, surrounded by those hills and mountains, what do you see? Magnificent scenery, right? Mountains represent for us majesty, stability, strength, firmness. But when the psalm was sung and written 2,500 years ago, a Hebrew would see and experience something entirely different when they looked up. Because in those hills were vagabonds and robbers. Hidden among that same hill was the holy city of Jerusalem. So the traveler traveling this trek would feel both anxiety and anticipation. And 2,500 years ago, Palestine was overrun with popular pagan worship. Much of this religion was practiced on those very hilltops, 
shrines, sacred groves of trees, and sacred prostitutes would lure people onto those mountaintops. And at these shrines, people would engage in acts of worship that would enhance the Earth's fertility, make people feel good, and that they thought would protect them from evil. There were protections, spells, sun and moon priests, all offering help in them thar hills. Well, did you know that some of these practices still happen today? As a postgraduate student, I took a road trip in Taiwan. We traveled through mountains, the kind of mountains that you see depicted in the um, landscape paintings that you would see in the, in the Museum of Fine Arts. I was on a rickety old bus. It was one of those white knuckle bus rides. We were traveling along gravel roads, and none of the roads had guardrails. Sometimes, if you dared to look out your window, you didn't see road, only the steep several thousand foot drop into something. <laughs> Face front, I told myself, face front. <laughs> At one point, while we were climbing up the steep section of this mission-shrouded one-lane mountain road, our bus driver just stopped. Without explanation, he pulled open the door, he jumped out of the bus, and into the mountain, he found this small shrine. He lit some of his jaw sticks, you know, those incense sticks. He bowed several times. I think he muttered some prayers. And in a flash, he was back into the driver's seat. He threw the bus into first gear, and we continued to careen down that narrow mountain road. My presence here tonight is a testimony to the bus driver's NASCAR driving skills. <laughs> Later, some missionaries told me that he was probably stopping to worship and offer thanks for safety, for, our um, for safety of travel to the local deities who he thought lived on those mountains. When you feel stuck, when I feel stuck, when I feel sick, scared or insecure, isn't it normal for us to cry out for help? Our children do it, right? Why don't we adults? When stuck, we're reminded here by the psalmist to lift our eyes to the hills. Where does our help come from? From the hills, from the spirits, from the deities who live in them? No, 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 is the firm reply. My help is from the Lord. He is the maker of heaven and earth. And ultimately, the hills don't help us. Instead of turning to the creation, the writer says, we got to turn to the creator. He is the one who offers us genuine help. He's available 24-7. But living in the year 2010, most of us are too sophisticated to be hoodwinked by pagan nature cults. But yet, in our times of distress or doubt, when we look to the hills and ask, where does my help come from? Who or what are we really trusting in? Where does our security really emanate from? Does it come from a profound belief in progress, in technology, that things can and do get better as long as we apply the right scientific solution and employ the best technology. That's very American, isn't it? Just put more money at it and we can solve it. And if we're going to believe Apple's marketing department, once the right app is downloaded, the iPad will soon solve healthcare reform and also global warming. <laughs> when you and I look around the hills for help, are you and I trusting in our own training, our education, our skills, our success in the marketplace, our good reputation? At the root of things, are we trusting in ourselves, our family and friends, and maybe even the ministry or church that we are called to lead and serve in? The psalmist points the finger right in your stomach and says, where does your help come from? Now, please don't get me wrong. These can be good things. Technology, a good career, a reputation, family and friends, a significant church ministry. But to remind all of us tonight, our God is a jealous God. He wants to be our first love. He tolerates no idols, whether they be virtual, ideological, or physical. God is the creator of the universe. He's the one that's given us life and breath. He wants to be the one that we go to. 
And God alone can deliver on his promise, saying, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. God alone will be with us through those deep waters. Ultimately, who or what are you trusting in when you call for help, when you look up to the hills? What are you trusting for your security today? Psalm 121 confidently declares that our help comes from the Lord. He is the maker of heaven and earth. He offers us this comprehensive self sense of safety. Day and night, he's standing guard. And just as he accompanied the people of Israel on their journey through the wilderness, so he promises to accompany each and every one of us as we journey through life as his sons and daughters. Verse 7b reads, he will watch over your life meaning not just your church life, not just your work life, not just your family life, but your whole living person, all of your life. He will watch over all of your life. Our creator God is this Lord over time, watching over our life no matter where you go, both now and forever. In our going out, in our coming in, in our beginnings and our endings, God is with you and me throughout life's journey. Well, friends, you don't have to be around the bushes, go around the bushes too many times to realize that in our journey of life, we go through seasons of orientation and disorientation. We face illness, aging, fear, insecurity, natural disasters, wars and rumors of wars, vexing family problems. And can we be honest with each other tonight? even or especially within the body of Christ, we experience cross-cultural misunderstandings, prejudice, and race wars. I know I've been part of conversations that have created all kinds of deep scars inside me. And if I'm honest with you, the misunderstandings can hurt so very much that I'm scared to try to come again. Genuine racial reconciliation feels so very elusive. It's still the devil's playground. But in this little nugget of a psalm, Psalm 121, he's, the psalmist is loud and clear. All the people and all the issues that may end up actually or figuratively harming us, in the end, they can't they cannot, they're powerless to inflict evil on us. God himself will protect us, guide us, and bless us as his children. Verse 7 says it loud and clear. The Lord will keep you from every kind of harm. Whom can you trust for help? Whom can I trust? Who is the one who offers us real, not simply perceived security? Well, on this road trip of life, on the journey that we embark on in this conference, let's sing together the Psalms of Ascent. They offer us courage, support, and inner direction for a Christian on our road of life. And as we journey to become more like Christ, each step we take, each breath that we breathe, know that you and I are preserved by God, accompanied by him, and ruled by him. I want to give the final word to Martin Luther, the great 15th century reformer. His hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, affirms the truth of God's preeminent trustworthiness. Listen as I read it. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. I gotta have an amen for that. Amen, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. We just celebrated Easter, the reality that, that he's not gonna prevail, friends. He's gonna be conquered. So as the truths of Psalm 121 continue to permeate into our hearts and minds, remember this. Faith is a solid, massive, secure experience of God. God who keeps all evil from coming inside us, the God who keeps our life, and the God who keeps 
are going out and are coming in from this day today here at Morning Star Baptist Church in Mattapan, Massachusetts, from this time on and forevermore. Hallelujah. Well, as I conclude for real, I want to share with you a tool. I'm in a black church. I can conclude multiple times, can I, pastors? You know? You can conclude multiple times. Here we go. But I want to give you a tool for crossing cultures, and it's called the Entry Posture Diagram. How many of you are familiar with it? I know some of you are. Great. Well, tonight's conference theme is a new kind of security. And if a city doesn't have walls, we got to be safe inside that city. What does it take for us to experience God as our source of security? How do we create and live in safe environments? Well, these days, when I go and see my physician, the nurse asks me, do you feel safe at home? At first, I was taken aback, but now I see how potentially revealing this question can be. Do you feel safe at home? And for us at this conference, do you feel safe at church? As leaders, do you feel safe in your church with your uh, parishioners? Do you feel safe in your small group? On your staff team, with your deacons and deaconesses and your elders, do you feel safe? In the places where you're engaged in the work of ministry, when you're moving God's kingdom ahead, shoulder to shoulder with fellow Christians, do you feel safe? Do your colleagues feel safety? Well, this diagram simply reminds us that we are all people of culture. And building God's kingdom on earth means we need to cross cultures. Sometimes crossing culture is very obvious. We just wing our little passport and you know, I'm going somewhere far, I need, uh, I need to think on my cross-cultural hat, even when you go to Canada, huh? Sometimes crossing culture is subtler. And tonight, I'd like you to try on the entry posture diagram for size. Use it as a paradigm for when you find yourself entering a new place, whether that culture requires you to take that passport and get on a plane or not. So to make this too practical, would you take a moment, and again, in your mind, think of a new culture that you currently find yourselves visiting, or one that you anticipate entering soon. In your mind's eye, think of a culture that's new to you, or one that you anticipate visiting at some point soon. It might even be here at the summit, as you initiate a conversation with someone who's not from your familiar circle of belonging. Do you got something? Have you a new culture in mind? Do I have a yes? yes? All right. All right, here, let's go through this um, PowerPoint. I heard a Chinese pastor say to me, PowerPoint has the point, but it doesn't have the power. <laughs> well, businesses have learned that crossing cultures take skill and effort. Can we see that thing? There's a little uh, entry posture diagram. It's on there. I think we need less lights on the screen, maybe. It's black, so it might be a little harder to see. Cross-cultural missionaries at home and abroad have learned the same thing, that crossing culture takes skill and effort. Businesses and mission agencies invest all kinds of money and time to prepare and train their staff before they even put them on a flight or send them out. So how can you and I more effectively enter into a new culture? Well, it begins, there we go, it begins with our approach, our mindset. How will we prepare ourselves as we enter a new situation? Will we enter it with openness, acceptance, trust, and adaptability? Wow, this is a new and different experience. I'm eating with my hands off of a banana leaf. Wow. Or am I going to enter that situation with suspicion, fear, superiority, or prejudice? Wow, it's just too bad that they can't afford cutlery and plates around here. Maybe I should tell them how we eat food in America, and maybe I'll offer to buy them a set. How are we going to approach this new situation? Soon and very soon, if we go beyond the cursory and superficial, if we leave our self-made holy huddle and comfortable cultural cocoon, we're going to enter and experience cultural differences. Dissonance means simply Ouch, ouch, things are really different around here. I don't know the rules. I don't know how to do things around here. For example, in some traditions, people don't talk when the preacher preaches. 
we're chosen and we're frozen. <laughs> In other traditions, we can't keep quiet when people are telling us truths about God. Amen and amen and amen. Ouch, dissonance. Well, has anybody felt these strong emotions when you enter a new situation, feeling insecure and uncomfortable? Next slide, please. There we go. Have you ever felt frustrated, misunderstood, confused, tense, embarrassed, even feeling a bit aggressive? If you haven't, you're probably either dead or lying. Just think back on your courtship when you entered the new culture of your spouse. Well, welcome to the non-travel brochure. What the leader didn't tell you about beforehand before you joined the trip. Because these are the facts of cross-cultural living. When we face the inevitability of cultural differences, we can respond in any number of ways. One would be to observe, inquire, listen, and initiate respectfully. Or you could respond with criticism. I've never seen, ever, ever seen such dirty bathrooms ever before in my life. I can't go. Or you could say, why can't they be more direct? These people always beat around the bush. They never tell you what you're thinking. You're always guessing, 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 guessing. Drive me crazy. Well, one might be tempted to rationalize the dissonance or even isolate yourself from the people and culture you're entering. That's called culture shock. But in this next slide, you see, if you choose to observe, to inquire, to listen and initiate, this usually results in understanding, empathy, and a deepened relationship. It may not be immediate, but if people see that you're gonna stick around for a while and are respectful and open, you find that people begin to open their hearts and minds to you, and it becomes much more of a reciprocal friendship. But you have a choice, and if you choose the route of cultural criticism and isolation, you're likely to experience alienation, withdrawal, and broken relationships. So brothers and sisters, here at the summit, let's not be surprised that if we risk going deeper by crossing culture into another person's ethnicity, theology, or worldview, we will experience dissonance. How we respond to the dissonance and difference can help us emerge with a greater understanding and appreciation of the diversity and the bigness of the family of God. Let's choose to understand and experience the fruit of our risk-taking with deepened relationships, not just for our sake, not just so that we have this more stamps, so to speak, in our heart of cultures that we visited and you know, have tasted the food of, but because it's for the honor and glory of God and his kingdom. We've already alluded to it. At the end of time, the, the nations will come to our Father and they're gonna bring the gifts from every tribe, nation, and tongue, and every people group, and it's gonna be a rich diversity of things. It's not gonna mean this plain vanilla group, huh? It's gonna be everything that we have and more. So let's risk taking this so that we can taste a bit of the beauty of the diversity and be willing to go through a little bit of the dissonance because we're different. My prayer for you and for us as uh, participants in the summit is that this summit is gonna be a safe place for you. May you sense the deep security that comes not from just this environment, but it comes ultimately from our trustworthy God. He's the one who watches over our lives. Let's trust him and believe him for that this week. 